I'm actually just the talking head. The work on all that I'll be saying now has actually been done by my colleague Kate Waddington and actually Emily's team at Gwyneth Archaeological <coughs> Trust. Um, the only real involvement I had with this project is I organized the money. Um, so my name's on it, but I haven't really done anything. Um, what, uh, what I'm talking about is a research project that we did at Bangor University, working together, <laughs> thankfully, with Gwyneth Archaeological Trust, even though in the original project design they weren't involved. So the idea I had did involve them in, oh, they've got the AGR, I'll grab data out of that, but with little afterthought, um, what would happen with this. But luckily, during the process of the project, that changed, mainly thanks to the work of, of Kate and Emily and her team. Um, so the, the collaboration with Gwyneth Archaeological Trust was really essential for this project to work. Um, the project I'm talking about actually was called um, Early Celtic Societies in Northwest Wales. It ran from 2009 to 2010 originally um, and was externally funded by what then was the Center for Advanced Welsh and Celtic Studies Publications and Collaborative Research Committee, um, a complicated name if I ever heard one, which previously had been the Board of Celtic Studies um, and which has now been completely disbanded. So sadly, there's no money to get from this anymore. Um, the aim of the project actually was to um, investigate the settlement archaeology for Northwest Wales from the late Bronze Age in to, to the end of the early medieval period, really, um, to create a database of all, all settlement sites, including the dated and the undated site, to produce a GIS analysis of the distribution of the settlements and, and so on, and to produce a detailed gazetteer that academics who don't necessarily always go to the AGR can actually use as an easier resource um, of, of all the sites that have been uh, a focus of excavation and survey. Um, it has already produced an output, this wonderful book by Kate, um, called The Settlements of Northwest Wales from the Late Bronze Age to the Early Medieval Period, um, and uh, that is effectively the gazetteer of sites and the analysis in four chapters um, that interpret that large set of data. Um, the set of data was actually quite substantial. There's uh, a total of uh, a bit over a thousand sites in Northwest Wales from that rather long period. Um, and it is a region that contains an actually quite well-preserved uh, settlement record. Um, there's a characteristic sequence of monument types that are found in the lowlands and along the edge of the uplands, particularly in the Northwest of the region. Um, <coughs> What is also quite nice, which makes it always quite uh, exciting to work with this stuff, is that large numbers of the settlements are actually built in stone architecture, um, which are quite regionally distinctive. Um, and since they are rather spectacular, as you can see on those images, they have been drawing quite some interest over the last, well, centuries really. So there has been quite a bit done. Um, in the 19th and 20th century in terms of excavation and survey. Um, also, uh, again, thanks mostly to the work of Gwyneth Archaeological Trust, um, there has been quite uh, a bit of work on, on lowland archaeology, so that has produced some, some, quite some evidence that it's not just the hill slopes and hill tops that have those stone-built settlements on them, but there is also a relatively dense occupation with timber settlements in the lowlands. So producing a synthesis and analysis of that data from an academic perspective was actually quite interesting. That was what I was interested in. So I got the money and got Kate to work on it. Uh, <laughs> now, the data that we collected was primarily collected from, from databases. Um, the historic environment record at, at Gwyneth Archaeological Trust was the main basis of our work, but we also integrated data from other existing project databases. Um, George Smith had uh, a cattle funded project that produced a database on roundhouse settlements and hill forts of Northwest Wales that was also located at Gwyneth Archaeological Trust. Eleanor Gay in another uh, Board of Celtic Studies project had looked at the Welsh roundhouses and had produced the Welsh roundhouse project database, and those databases were 
put together. We also looked at the great literature and published literature and tried to pull that all together into one sort of data set. Now, what was very important at the beginning of the project is effectively that Kate went down the hill, because we're on the hill where Gwyneth Archaeological Trust is at the bottom, um, went down to Gwyneth Archaeological Trust and said to effectively Emily, how are we going to do that best? Um, and that led to a series of meetings where um, that point of how can we uh, archive that data that we're producing and make use of it beyond the pure academic element, um, that wasn't extensively discussed. And effectively, they agreed upon producing a data set that was compatible with and effectively reintegratable um, into the historic environment record, so a compatible data to the AGR data. Um, as I said before, it wasn't my original idea to do that because I didn't give shit um, about it, to be honest. Um, but it was a very, very good idea. Um, and therefore, I was happy with it. Um, I was the project leader, theoretically, so I had to sign that off. Um, but that was fine. Um, and, and it actually proved to be very, very fortunate and very productive. Also in academic terms, I'll be coming back to that at the end, impact is now big in the academic world, and actually producing something that is of use to anyone is suddenly important. Um, so it was very fortunate, and that is something that should be kept in mind throughout this. Um, at any rate, we tried to integrate the databases, and um, of course, those databases that we were trying to integrate weren't necessarily originally constructed to be integrated with each other, so part of the work went into thinking about how we could put this together. Um, and of course, the closer those were in design, the, the easier the integration was. So, database design. Um, the AGR stuff effectively gave us guidance um, on how to do this so that we could create a database that was compatible with theirs. Um, AGR data is um, effectively created in the form of a core table with three child tables. You can see that here, um, one on general information, one on finds, one on sources. Um, and all that is linked by the primary rec reference numbers that um, basically connect all the things up. Um, so we, wor we started working with, with that structure, but since there are child tables, oops, um, we effectively could add additional child tables to the database. Um, so that, that is database structure that we exploited. But um, in red here on, on the right, you can see the data tables that were already there. So the core table, the general information finds and sources. But we added additional child tables. Um, uh, about site attributes, uh, radiocarbon dates, uh, environmental data, and roundhouse data to pull that data together in a format that was useful for us for the analysis because we wanted to take all those elements into account, but also was compatible with the AGR data and therefore in the end would be possible to feed that back into this. We also um, on advice of Nina Steele, who's one of uh, Emily's team, um, created the database map um, to provide um, a way that uh, outlines how different databases uh, were integrated within our database. Um, so that there is a clear record of how these things fit together. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Now, putting that all together was actually quite easy. It were um, various queries that we set up in Microsoft Access that allowed us to pull the data together. We then, or actually Kate then, integrated that data and enhanced it via data collected from published and unpublished literature, as well as through some of our own field work. Um, and 
all that led to a final database that when the book had been finished, the book that I showed before, um, was basically provided back to Gwyneth Archaeological Trust for reintegration into the historic environment record. Now, of course, there were teething problems with this nonetheless, but over the last year and a half about, that was trans uh, successfully transferred over into the HER. Um, and that was only really possible because there was an ongoing conversation throughout the whole project and its afterlife, how we could do that, that we were always clear what we had to do to enable reintegration and that Gwyneth Archaeological Trust was also where what was coming <laughs> down to them. Um, we also then um, tried to develop um, a, a way forward, the guidelines for how to do that by putting one of our master students uh, into all this that gave that student the funded masters, which is always welcome. Um, and she undertook a work placement with Gwyneth Archaeological Trust to do, develop guidelines on how to best do that. And those highlight that high levels of contact and communication must, of course, be maintained at all stages of the project between researchers and AGR staff. And they also developed a number of sort of best practice guidelines um, that basically say it's important to ensure the data is managed correctly and efficiently, that researchers, databases, and records must be guaranteed to be complete and accurate, um, that time is saved to uh, and resources are saved to reduce duplication of effort and to reduce the risk of duplication with data, uh, with, with the AGI and the research data set that communication must be maintained. Um, now, clearly, designing databases so that they are similar and co compatible with HER databases is clearly a positive thing. But it's important to stress that we are not recommending that all project databases must follow a rigid structure determined by the HER, because on the research side, that is not always what is the best. But um, and, and that it, it's important that data collection isn't restrained by this, but creating databases, new databases, that aren't mindful of existing databases isn't sensible because it is uselessly wasting uh, resources in a sector that is already underfunded. So, conclusions quickly. What is important for us is that impact element. Um, Impact generated by a project can be hugely increased by a research project like this at effectively very little or no additional cost um, by collaborating with the HER from the start um, when a research project utilizes HER data. Um, the enhancement of the HER data ultimately not only has an effect on the quality of information housed in the HER, but also has that element of the project, the research project, having actually done something that is helpful to anyone but the 20 academics who might be interested, because it feeds back into the planning process and development control process itself. The data collection itself also becomes more efficient and structured, because you can draw on something that is already there, so it actually helps the project um, and saves resources in the project. And that might make it advisable that funding bodies that fund research could be advised on the importance of such data exchanges. Um, so might be an idea to include that in best practice guidance by CIFA or something like that. Um, as far as I can say, I mean, much of this isn't yet common practice in the academic sector, but um, we need to work on establishing a more respectful working relationship perhaps sometimes with project staff and HER uh, staff because that helps creating outputs that are both academically interesting and useful for actual planning work. Thank you. <laughs>